following is a video presentation of an evening worship service at Orville Baptist Church.
to do to, uh, to start our service, I'd love to read from the book of Ephesians. Um, we'll be in Galatians tonight. We're going to go one book past Galatians, book of Ephesians, chapter 2, and read verses 1 through 9. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the, of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest of God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Tonight we will be in Galatians chapter 2, talking about the true gospel. And I read those words from Paul in Ephesians 2, and it's such a poignant, I don't think there's quite words as you read Galatians, or excuse me, Ephesians 2, 1 through 9, to see that even in our trespasses, even in our sin, even in being children of wrath is what we're called. We are made alive by the sacrifice by the work of Christ. I pray that that's something that is on our mind as we gather to worship each and every time as the church of Oral Baptist. Um, we will continue on with a little bit of what we talked about this morning uh, during our message tonight, uh, looking at Peter and getting ahead to the church in Antioch, uh, talking about that, that group this morning that was causing him a little bit of trouble. I want to dive into that tonight and talk about Really what we just said in Ephesians, this true gospel, what it is, and um, how important the gospel is for us. A lot of times we talk about John 3, 16, and it's good before you're saved, and you don't really pay attention to it afterwards, and you know, I'm telling you, church, it's the best message you'll ever hear. Pre-salvation and post-salvation is the, the message of the cross, the gospel, uh, the sweetest word you can ever hear. Do um, you got your bulletin with you? We'll quickly go through it. Uh, very fast, I, I reminded church this morning on our prayer list has been shortened down a lot. Uh, do not fear. If you see someone missing that you know needs to be on there, um, just add it uh, either by note. You can put an opportunity plate if you like. You can call the church office. You can let me know. And what, one thing we're asking with the prayer list, um, a lot of times we get a name on there, and for the most part we can kind of know what we're going through. We're going to ask if you would, um, if you send in a prayer request, would you put if, if you're able to, if you're allowed to, uh, that kind of thing. If you, if you can put what someone's dealing with, um, we would love to put that in emergency beside their name. Because as we pray, we want to be specific in our prayers. Um, God certainly knows what they're going through. And we can say that in our prayers. God, you do know. And that's equally as, as, as strong and powerful. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but we do want to uh, we do want to pray specifically for people and make sure we're going through. And ask them to be taken away or changed or uh, healing would take place in the name of Christ. So um, as you send in a prayer request, if you do that, we'd greatly appreciate it. On the back of your bulletin, uh, business as usual. Um, we have uh, we're meeting here tonight uh, for worship, and then uh, Wednesday, the hour of power. Um, it's our Wednesday night service. We're we'll going through the spiritual gifts. Um, very beneficial, very helpful uh, study we've gone through. We don't have much left, and um, I've kind of said this a couple times on Sundays. If you if you've been wanting to join that study and you think well it's too late now because you're so far ahead. Um, you're, you're, you're wrong. Um, we're going to continue going on. We don't have any sessions left and looking at the spiritual gifts. But the very last night, we're going to do a full recap. Um, so we're going to go through all of those gifts. We're going to describe all those gifts. And um, it should be a special night because I'm, I'm thinking that we'll all have some things to tell each other, uh, some ways to edify each other. And um, I'm looking forward to that. So that'll probably be in just a couple of weeks. Uh, but keep that in mind. Um, and we'll, we'll move on to our, our next study, either the book or something like spiritual gifts after this, but I, I can't tell you how beneficial it's been to uh, our crowd on Wednesdays. Um, it certainly impacted me a lot, and I pray the same for, for everyone else who's been joining us. Uh, two offerings, you can see those at the very bottom of your bulletin. Jane Chapman, um, have not counted what was given this morning, but 
before this morning of $717.63, and then also our Oregon fund uh, is at eight. $820.32. Uh, the goal for the Oregon Fund is $1,400. We're about $600 short, roundabout. Um, so let's, let's pray and see how we can um, meet these goals as, as quickly as possible. Uh, we want to be people who, who set goals and then also meet those goals. Uh, we, want to, uh, we want to pray about how we can give and what we can do as a church together. And then lastly, I announced this morning, um, on the 31st of October, we will do a short retreat out front. There'll be you know, some more details that kind of come out as we as we go on. But essentially, what we'll do is uh, you can all, you can go ahead and be stockpiling if you like. Candy. Uh, we'll have cars pull up side by side out here in the front parking lot. You kind of face the all all the same direction, and it literally is called trunk or treat for a reason. You have candy in the trunk of your car, SUV, whatever it may be. Uh, you can decorate your vehicle if you like. And as kids are are coming going to the area and they're stopping by, we'll put it down in the middle board. We'll put signs out all that kind of. Kids and their families uh, will come in, get some candy. And, uh, we don't want to just get candy and say bye. Uh, we want to be people who interact with families, with parents. Uh, we'll have uh, some literature to give out. We'll give out information about our church. Uh, most importantly, we're going to let people know we care about them. Um, and it's not just here's some sugar. So go have a sugar rush and crash for, for school tomorrow. It's, it's so much more than that. We want to be people who let up and we let neighbors know that we care about them. So we want to tell them we care about them, we want to tell them we love them, and most importantly, we want to pray and hope uh, that we see gospel interactions here in that church. We want to tell people about Jesus, we want to tell people about Christ. Um, and if handing out candy out of the back of the trunk sounds creepy, it is. <laughs> but if that's a doorway in which we can have gospel conversations, I'm all for it. So I'm looking forward to that. And uh, be, be in prayer for that as our church and also as our neighbors who come to that.
This morning we went through Acts 11 and we saw that, if you were with us this morning, we saw that Peter was initially questioned upon his return to Judea and Jerusalem about his dealings uh, with the Gentiles. One of the big questions being, did you really sit with these Gentiles and eat with these Gentiles? And um, his time in Caesarea was a major door being opened to the Gentile world. Advance of the gospel is no longer just for Jews and Samaritans. It has now been opened uh, to Gentiles. And it's a massive shift for the church at large, which, of course, you know, Peter preaches the word to Cornelius and his household, um, his servants, people under him. They all hear the word, and the Spirit falls on the Gentiles, much like we saw at Pentecost. Almost a miniature version of that. People are speaking in tongues, even. It's an incredible moment. And these Judaizers, as we call them, they were upset. This news came back to Judea and Jerusalem, and they were upset, not about um, so much the gospel being spread to Gentiles. They were upset with Peter, and that, I mean, legitimately angry with him, that he had even sat in their house on England. That was their big hang up. Um, just a very strange occurrence in the life of the church. And so they questioned about it. They're angry. And I made the point this morning from Galatians 2 that. When Luke in Acts 11 writes about these uncircumcised men raising these questions, it's not, it's not language talking about all Jews. It's a very specific group. And I read that verse in Galatians 2 in which Paul says, yes, it was a very specific group that, that accused uh, Peter of doing this and uprooting Mosaic tradition and they believed that Christ was Messiah. They followed Christ. Remember, they taught. You have to also follow the Mosaic law. You have to be circumcised to become a Christian. Very messy situation. A very tragic situation. We concluded that the church, even in the earliest days, we always say we need to get back to doing what the early church was doing. We said yes and no. We need to be doing the spiritual things that the early church was doing. But we also came to the conclusion that even from the onset, the church has never been perfect. That day does not happen until we see Christ face to face and reside with him in heaven. We know these men from Acts 11 were an actual group because we read about them in Galatians 2. That's what I want us to look at tonight. I want us to go to that account that we kind of briefly introduced this morning. And that there's some really shocking information in Galatians 2. I hope that everyone's familiar with it. A lot of people, they go to Galatians 2. We're going to do verses 11 through 14, by the way. Galatians 2, 11 through 14. A lot of people go through this text, and they're very shocked. It's a very jarring piece of Scripture. And so let's, let's talk about the book of Galatians by itself before we get there. The book of Galatians, in a nutshell, is about the preservation of truth. Paul is writing, defending the gospel. Paul is writing, saying you have to take grasp of what the gospel is and preserve it. Do not allow it to be distorted. There's some practical guidance that, that, that Paul gives in the book of Galatians, but for the most part, especially uh, the first three chapters, it's just hold on to the truth, hold on to the truth, and do not let go. And then five and six, we get some more practical advice on what it means to be a Christian. The overall truth of the gospel. And from the opening of the letter, Paul just gets straight to the point. And there's many reasons why I love Paul. One of those many reasons is when he writes, it is a freight train. Compound words after compound words will run on sentences after run on sentences. And he does not stop. He just lets it be known. Paul gets straight to the point from the moment you open Galatians. You can listen. If you want to turn there, you're more than welcome. I'd love to read a section of chapter 1. Starting in verse 6, listen to Paul's words. This is just so straightforward. Paul says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be a curse. As we have said before, so I say it again now. If any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. Back to back. Remember what it says this morning in repetition? If you see something back to back, it means it's important. Verse 10, for am I now seeking the favor of men or God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not 
be a bond servant of Christ. Really good introduction for the rest of the book. Paul is laying it straight out. If there's any distortion of the true cross of Christ, if there's any distortion of what we initially preached to you, if there's any distortion of what the saints have handed down over these past years, that person is to be accursed. There is nothing to add to the gospel of Christ. It's just an all-out assault on false teaching and distortion of the gospel. Anything that steers from the cross, anything that steers away from the truth, is to be abandoned. It is to be killed. It is to be left alone. And the person who preaches it is to be accursed. And there's a reason why this is happening throughout the letter, even before verse 6. If you just read the first five verses, all throughout chapter 1 and 2, Paul's having to defend his apostleship. We're going to come back and kind of answer the why. But he has to lay a case out for why he's an apostle. You may be thinking, that's very strange, a random part of this letter. Why is he having to defend it? And so do you see what I mean when I say the church was never perfect, even in the early stages? There was always division. There was always trouble. Not until heaven do we see that perfect church. This is not Paul writing to a group of non-believers. This is Paul writing to a church. He's addressing the church, men and women who were saved, and they haven't lost it. They're still saved, but they are confused. They're followers of Christ, but there is a conflict. And they were dealing with some erroneous teaching. Beginning in chapter 2, Paul writes to the apostle Peter, and Paul does use Peter's Aramaic names, Cephas, you may see it as Cephas, uh, in, in, your, in your translation. He was given a specific ministry to the Jews. Peter, that is. Whereas Paul's on the opposite side. Paul's given a, a distinct ministry to the Gentiles. Peter was primarily preached, or taught to, or excuse me, instructed to preach to the Jews back home to tell them the gospel of Christ. Even though he was one who unlocked that key to the Gentile world, it was Peter who was to stay in Judea and Jerusalem. It was Paul who was to go to the rest of the world. Something we're coming up to soon in Acts. We need to keep that in mind as we go throughout the rest of this letter. Paul and Barnabas, they're the ones going to the Gentiles. Peter's the one staying, quote, home to the Jews. And that's where we get into our text. Though. That's kind of our context, our build up to this verse. We're going to see some problems arise. Really a shocking text to read. So let's just read those, those verses. 11, 12, 13, and 14. I'll just go through them in, in their entirety. Then we'll come back and we'll break them down line by line. Starting in verse 11. But when Cephas, also Peter, came to Antioch, I posed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, this is Paul talking to Peter, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? You all heard that, right? And I just read it. It's a, it is, it really is, it's a jarring text. It's a very shocking text. And that is why I, I, mean, I said what I said this morning. That initial celebration, if you remember this, remember we left off this morning? The Judaizers, they glorified God, saying, oh my, this is, this is, this is really happening to people. The Gentiles have received the word, they received the spirit, they're celebrating. You remember what I said after that? Sadly, it doesn't stick. That's where we left off this morning. Sadly, that celebration does not last. It goes away. You're seeing it now. No longer is that celebration happening. Now they're back to their old ways. Peter told them the Spirit fell on the Gentiles. They rejoiced. Some time later, once again, back to being Judaizers. They looked their old ways and their their influence, sadly, grew. Even bigger. Even more influential. And when you hear that about Peter, you, you hear what went on between Paul and Peter. It's just jarring to read that. You don't expect it. For some, it may sound really disheartening. We know that the scriptures are perfectly inerrant, but we do have 
have this tendency to think too highly about the people of the Bible. Of course, God being perfect. Of course, Jesus being perfect. Of course, the Spirit being perfect. But Peter, Paul, Barnabas, we, we begin to put these men on pedestals and we, we think they're perfect. And you're seeing proof of it now. There was conflict. Peter and Paul had an argument. They butted heads. I'm highly thankful for Peter and Paul, but I still have to remind myself they were men. They were just mortal men. Fallen men. Remember Paul's previous life was Saul. Are you going to tell me he was perfect? Same with Peter. What did he do? He denied Christ. We do have to remind ourselves we're talking about real men who are imperfect. We sin, we mess up, we disappoint. They're no different. The exact same thing. They're not God. And here we, we read that Peter has messed up. Peter has messed up pretty big, too. And this is after. Understand this. This is after he's gone to the Gentiles. This is after Pentecost that we read about Peter messing up. You just don't expect that at all. You kind of expect him to do the right thing all the time. So let's just walk through this line by line for just a few minutes, and I, I think we'll see the point here. Verse 11, one more time. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. A serious confrontation. I mean serious. This is a big deal. It's not something to take lightly. I appreciate Paul's boldness. I really do. I appreciate greatly Paul's boldness in verse 11. When people are confident in the truth, they'll approach face to face. If you know something for a fact, 100%, there's no way you're wrong, you don't have any problem going to someone's face. Why? Because the truth is behind you. You don't have to worry about being wrong. Paul knew the truth, 100%. And so what does he do? He goes to Peter face to face. And he's doing what's best, not just for himself, but also for Peter. Paul is also what's doing best for the truth, contending for the truth. But don't read this and think he hates Peter. In all honesty, he's doing what's best for Peter. He doesn't send some anonymous letter to Peter. He doesn't gossip about Peter. He goes to Peter face to face. Verse 11 says that Peter stood condemned. Now that does not mean that Peter has lost his salvation. By no means. He has not lost his salvation. The Spirit's not away from Peter. There's nothing like that. This is another one of those terms that does have some fluidity and grief. There's some different meanings depending on how it's used. And Paul is writing that Peter stood the wrong. That's what, that's what this means right here. It says that Peter stood condemned, it means he, he stood on the wrong side of truth. He stood in error. There's no gray area. There's right, there's wrong. There's truth, there's a lie. He was on the opposite side of the truth. Peter found himself standing on a line. That's what's being said here. Paul says, I went face to face with Peter. I approached him because he was in the wrong, and I knew it. Paul says, I knew for a fact he was away from the truth. And for that reason, I went to his eye level, to his face, and I had no problem with it because I knew the truth. I knew the truth. He was flat out wrong on something. If you truly love someone and they're in the wrong, do you want them to say that? Don't be that this is like. If you know a friend, a brother or a sister, and they, they are absolutely in the wrong, would you like them to say they're in the wrong? Of course not. If you care about them, what would you do? Approach them. To leave them alone in their own wrongness, in their own sin, in their own error, is to truly despise someone. Truly despise someone. To leave them in that error is a hatred that we can't explain. There's no such thing as loving someone and yet knowing they're wrong and leaving them in it. Paul had a deep love for the truth of the gospel. On top of that, he had a brotherly love for Peter. He had a love for Peter. For those two reasons, he goes to him. Still brothers in Christ. Because of Paul's conviction for the truth and for this protection of the truth, he had to confront Peter. He had to go to him or something. So you're asking yourself, what on earth? Okay, so Peter is this guy who's done all these incredible things and acts. You might, be, you might be wondering, what could possibly go on from Peter's point of view? It would cause Paul to go to him and tell him he's wrong. What could, what could Peter have possibly done? We're talking about the same Peter down in Acts, right? Not that guy. 
the one who's been changed so much, the one who opened the door to the Gentiles and the household of Cornelius, doing all these incredible things for the Lord. Yes, that same Peter. That same man. And again, he's not perfect. We get the first bit of insight in verse 12 as to where Peter has gone wrong. So let's read that. Verse 12. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. We get more insight in the next verse, and we'll get there. But there you go. Verse 12. Now you're starting to understand what has gone wrong. We get three, well, truly, we get four different characters mentioned here. So quickly, let's, let's look at how this scenario plays out. First, there's a mention of James, that theme in verse 12, refers to Peter. Then there's a mention of the Gentiles. And then finally, there's a they, as we're referring to the party of the circumcision. So there's your, there's your characters in this scenario. There's who involved in this. Those four characters, James, Peter, Gentiles, Judaizers. So here's how this unfolded with those four characters. James is in Jerusalem. James is basically staying at the unofficial headquarters of the church in Jerusalem. He's staying behind, quote, quote. James is in Jerusalem, so to speak, with this, this oh, I guess that's the best I can put it, headquarters. These Judaizers come to Antioch from Jerusalem. And here's what they do. They go to Antioch and they say, hi, we're from James. James has sent us. You know James, the, the unofficial guy over in Jerusalem? He sent us here to Antioch. We're on his authority to preach a message. That's what the Judaizers are doing. There's a problem there, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. There's also two other characters. There's Peter, and there's Gentiles. Paul says he used to sit with them. He used to do things with Gentiles, and no longer is that happening. I'm talking about Peter. Those Judaizers come on this perceived authority of James, a.k.a. they are liars. And they know they're liars. Why would they say we come from James? Why would they go to the church in Antioch and say, hey, James sent us to tell this message that we want to give? Why would they do that? Because they know their name means nothing. They know they can't be trusted. There's letters out there. We've talked about this on the before. There's a lot of letters out there. We call it pseudepigrapha. People will write things that look like scripture. At the very end, they'll write the Apostle Paul. <laughs> Why do they do that? Because they're nobodies. But if they put Paul down, they might get read. Same thing happened here. These Judaizers go from Jerusalem to Antioch and they say we're from James because they think that'll carry weight because they know they're liars. They know they're not telling the truth. This is what liars have to do. They have to make up some kind of authority because the reputation is garbage. Absolute filthy reputation. Why would anyone want to listen to them? They have to be sneaky about it. So they claim to speak for James. They, they claim to come from James. It's just a ruse. It's a disguise they wear to teach them. And before they arrived, Peter dined and he sat with the Gentiles in Antioch. He had conversations with them. He went to their feasts. He went to their, their love feasts. Went to their uh, Lord's Supper with them. Went to their households. He had food that was once considered unclean. He enjoyed all these things with the Gentiles. All that changed when the Judaizers arrived. Very odd. Very strange actions of Peter. Every bit of that changed. When the Judaizers came, it said Paul writes that Peter began to withdraw and hold himself aloof from the Gentiles. The Greek is essentially the same. Peter began to remove himself and exclude himself. That's all that said. Slowly, he started to back away. When the Judaizers came to Antioch, Peter, who was always with the Gentiles, he began to kind of step back. He didn't want to be seen with them. And eventually, he was never with them. They had the Lord's Supper, Peter wasn't there. They had a feast, Peter wasn't there. They had a prayer service, Peter wasn't there. The more and more the Judaizers called in Antioch, the less and less Peter had anything to do with the Gentiles. Had nothing to do with them. You read that, right? That's, that's so discouraging. When I read that, in my heart literally, it sinks. It just, it just floors me to see this man we think so highly of, named Peter, do this. It just kills me. 
and it's such an influential text, and yet I, mean, I have this, this feeling about it. It's so hard for me to understand, and it's so hard for me to describe, because it hurts so bad. You know, you talk about somebody who you really respect and admire and mean so much to, that you look up to, and you find out that they sin, and I mean like a, a heavy, deep cut in sin, what does it do? You don't get mad at them, you hurt. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but I've had role models that I thought the world of, and I find out something they did, and I just admit it. I'm not upset with it. It just crushes it. We do this to each other when we sin. So many times we think that sin is just this individual thing that only affects us. Look, my sin and your sin, it affects each other, all of us. There's no such thing as individual sin, especially in church. We should be the person who just throws the finger up and throws the judgment up and says, you got to get out of here. Instead, we should be the people who says, I hurt. My heart's broken with you. And I'll bear your burdens with you. But I can't help but tell you I'm disappointed. That's what true love is. Hatred is just saying, get out of the door. Get out of here. What are going to do with you? Love says, repent. Because you've broken God's heart and you're breaking mine. That's what Peter's done here. It's just an unbelievable thing. No such thing as individual sin. It's harmful to not just one, but to all. And so why did Peter do this? We get the answer. It's out of fear. It says he feared the party of the circumcision. This group of men that we first met in Acts 11. Why did Peter begin removing himself from the Gentile? Because he was afraid. He was afraid of these Mosaic Jews who claimed to follow Christ. Now, Peter did not fear that they would kill him or throw him. We're not talking about persecution. It's not that kind of fear. What did we already address about Peter and Paul's ministry? Paul was to minister to the Gentiles, and Peter was to minister to who? Jews. Paul was to minister to the Gentiles, Peter was to minister to the Jews, and now here he is mingling with Gentiles. What do you think he was afraid of? He was afraid of his own reputation. He was afraid of things of the flesh, silly things. He was afraid of his ministry being destroyed. He was worrying about things in the flesh. He was not trusting God in his ministry. He was fearing that his ministry would fail. What happens if the Judaizers see me talking to the Gentiles? What are they going to do? What are they going to think about me? Are they going to listen to me? Are they just going to abandon me? Will this whole thing just fall apart? That's Peter's fear. What a fleshly fear that is. He didn't really kill him. He was afraid in the flesh. He feared man over God in the silliest of ways. And it's absolutely tragic. It's so heartbreaking. And this, this I mean, the, the next verse, we're going to read that right now. This is the, and they just, we're waiting for some good news, right? <laughs> All this, we're just waiting to hear good news, and I got bad news for you instead. It just snowballs. There's just another snowball effect happening. Look at verse 13. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas, even Barnabas, Paul's brother in ministry, even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. You think you don't have influence, but your actions don't affect the church? That's a lie. It's a teetotal lie. Look what Peter did. Paul says that the rest of the Jews joined Peter in his hypocrisy. Wow, that's strong. Extremely strong language. He is absolutely calling Peter out. He's become a hypocrite. That's what Peter is now. Peter has become a hypocrite. A man who has seen the hand of God move greatly in Samaria. Into Gentile lands. This same Peter has now become a hypocrite. Liars infiltrate the church at Antioch. Peter fears for them. Peter goes along with it just to keep up the appearances. He listens to their teachings and says, oh yeah, you're right, they didn't have to follow the Mosaic law. Because he doesn't want to stir up anything. He doesn't want to ruin his own ministry. So why is Peter a hypocrite? That's the most crushing part of all of it. Because he knows them. And he acts differently. The very definition of a hypocrite. One who says one thing and does another. That's Peter. Right here in Galatians 2. 
It's hard to say that out loud. A person who says one thing and does something different. Preaching one thing and acting very differently. He's preaching one thing to the Gentiles and now he's making to go along with the teaching of the Judaizers. Do you see the problem there? Tragic. He's telling the Judaizers that they're right in their teaching and he's abandoning the truth that is played in his heart, but he knows better. That's the, that's the wicked part. Peter knows this isn't true. He knows better. He knows the gospel. And yet he's appeasing the Judaizers because he doesn't want, to, he doesn't want his ministry to fall. He doesn't want it to fall apart. So he just goes along with it. Depending on who he's talking to, Peter's the ultimate fence traveler. To the Gentiles, he says one thing. Oh, yeah, sounds good. Great. Yeah, shake hands. Okay, but I can't be seen with you. When the Judaizers come, he says something completely different. Hypocrisy. Absolute hypocrisy. The gospel has been preached to the Gentiles. That door has been opened, and now everyone, Judaizers, Peter, even Barnabas now, are perverting the gospel. Even Barnabas. It's just like, what God was going to fall next in this story? He's waiting on Paul to say, all right, why flag? Instead, Paul is called the middle of it. You remember how I said that Paul writes a lot about defending his apostleship. Well, do you understand why now? Do you, can you start to connect the dots and kind of read from the lines just a little bit? These, these Judaizers came in and they all said, do not listen to Paul. They were telling the church in Antioch this. Peter was there listening to it. They said, he calls himself an apostle. He's appointed himself an apostle. Do not listen to that man. Why do you think Paul spent so much time in Galatians proving why he's an apostle? That very reason. They said he wasn't one. And Paul spends line after line after line saying, here's how you can know that I'm an apostle. He says, I didn't train under Peter. I wasn't there in the early church with that kind of calls. Paul says, I didn't get my revelation from these men. You know where I got my knowledge of Jesus? From Jesus himself for three years. Remember semi recently in Acts? We talked about Paul journeying out at the time he saw. About three years he spends wandering, resting in the Lord, desiring the Lord. And the Spirit's just constantly just revealing his truth to him in prayer. Paul says, that's how you can know I'm an apostle. None of these men taught me anything. I received this from Christ himself. He kicked me off that horse on the road to Damascus, and I had the same sense. He says, I wasn't appointed an apostle by any of these people in the church. I wasn't appointed an apostle by Christ. And when I was brought forward to the church, they wrote off on it. These men signed off on it. They saw it. They even said, he preaches the truth. He says, all this in Galatians. Paul says, when I came before the church, Peter was there. All of them said, we haven't taught him anything, but he preached the truth. He preaches the gospel. He is an apostle. Paul writes all this as a defense. All of this as a defense as to why he can be trusted. Why did they do all this? Why did you guys just do all this? Because he was the one man they had to discredit. They were not people. The power of God was just way too strong. The only way they could make their legalistic teaching advance was to discredit and silence Paul. That is why Paul spends so much time defending his apostleship. Not from man, but from God alone. And all the time, three years that these apostles spent with Jesus in his ministry, Walking with them, seeing his miracles. They spent three years with him. Guess what? I did too. And I was by myself. I wasn't with all these men. We all spent three years just different ways. You see why he's so passionate about this in Galatians 2? We're dealing with life and we're dealing with death. And for Paul, the truth of the gospel is life and the perversion of the gospel is death. Everything hinges on the truth of God's word. Just to, try, just to drive this point home, look at verse 14. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Caiaphas, Peter, in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, 
live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews? How is it you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? That was the question Paul had for Peter. In other words, how can you be a Jew who acts like a Gentile, but then go to the Gentiles and say you got to act like a Jew? That's Paul's question to Peter. How can you do this? That's his main question. How can you say one day and act a different way? And then how can you go to the same people you're teaching and teach them something wrong? Face to face. Paul says this to Peter. And so once again, I ask the question, does Paul hate Peter? No, absolutely not. Does he dislike Peter? No, absolutely not. Does he think he's in the wrong? Absolutely yes. He thinks he's in the wrong. He knows he's in the wrong. Why? Because Peter has the sort of truth. He's fallen under some false teaching from the Judaizers. Why does he speak so strongly? Because Paul loves the truth of God. And he wants to steer Peter back into that truth, which does happen. Isn't that beautiful? He does steer him back into the light, into the truth. There's still Judaizers walking today, but there's no official party. Sometimes people say it's the SDC. No, it's not. No, absolutely not. It's just fractions of people. Delighting in the works of the flesh, not of the cross. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, this is how we should feel about the truth of the gospel in the same way that Paul does. This should be our passion, our burning heart for the gospel. The same feeling that Paul has. If you were with us this morning, you remember us talking about placing hurdles, placing hoops in front of people who need to be saved. And how it's so completely wrong. And dress a certain way, act a certain way, say a certain thing, have a certain amount of money, a set amount of money, act like me, talk like me. A lot of times I'm telling people, you've got to be like me before you can be like Jesus. No, you've got to be like Jesus because he's the only path to salvation. You've got to know him. Remember earlier, we talked about the Judaizers. Well, what did they do? They said, well, first you've got to get circumcised so you can become a Jew, so you can become a Christian. That's, that's so wrong, so evil, so wicked. And we know it's wicked, yet we do the same exact thing. First you've got to act like me, then you might have to follow Christ. Wrong! Imitate me as I imitate Christ. But know Him. No extra hoops, no extra hurdles. Just repent and believe. So does this passage teach, and does it mean that you're to be on the lookout 24-7 for people to confront and know? That's not what we need to take away from. The, the idea is not you need to be putting a flash on everybody looking for someone to confront and argue with. That's not the point. It's so far from the point. At the same time, hear me out. Listen to this. Hear me out. Are you willing to? When it comes to the truth of the gospel, are you willing to? When it comes to the purity of the church, are you willing to? When it comes between right and wrong, are you willing to? For Paul, the answer is yes. What about us? If there is a distortion of the gospel, if it does become something more than Jesus, are we willing to confront it? Jesus plus something equals nothing. Understand that. Jesus plus something, garbage. You can't add anything to his work. There's nothing to add. It's done. Jesus plus nothing knows everything. Everything. Nothing you can add to his work. None of us. I can't, you can't. It's his work alone. Anything we add on top of it is a distortion of the true gospel of Christ. So I want you to hear this and not be looking for people to go attack. That's not, that's not the point. If it comes down to that, are you willing to? The answer should be yes. Question. Call them out. You preach the gospel, but you tell people they must clear this hurdle first. That's wrong. If you love someone, you're teaching that, you go to them. I want you to hear 
do this, and I want to let it work on our hearts so that we desire the one true gospel, the one and for all true gospel of Christ. And there's no distortion from it whatsoever. No strings attached, no extra hoops, nothing to add. If, if someone has no works after their salvation, guess what? They're not a Christian. <laughs> but is it because of their works? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We would have to look at James. You say you got faith, there's no works. Guess what? Your faith is dead. There's going to be something after that. But your salvation has nothing to do with what you've done in your works. Not one bit. It's because you've been saved that your fruit will be born. It's because of God working in you that you will see works happen. When Christ calls a man to himself, he also calls him to his work. Not in order to be saved, but because he is saved. And when the gospel becomes, do work in order that you can be saved, the truth can be heard. Simple as that. We fight for this truth at all costs. At all costs. Even if we have to address it face to face. Many times the church has been accused of being a cruise ship. Get on board and you just kind of navigate through life and Relaxing environment, enjoying the niceties of life, having a good time. And yes, we do have a good time at the church. Absolutely. I love our time together. We have a lot of fun together. I enjoy being with you. I enjoy talking to you. I hope you can say the same thing. I have fun we eat together. We do things together. But it's not crucial. It's not crucial at all. It's not a fortress. We're on the biggest battleship we could ever imagine. Yes, there's times to defend. There's also times to go after the truth and say, hey, we don't lose sight of this. We don't lose the grip on this at all. Like anything that comes to threaten the truth, we discard. Christian life is a life of defense and attack. It sounds strange that we're people called peacemakers, and yet we're still on a battleship, right? But it's true. We defend at all costs. At all costs. The moment there's a threat to the truth and the gospel of Christ and the cross of Christ, you're moved. The purity of the gospel, the purity of the church, and the glorification of the Father. There's one cross and three nails and one Savior on that tree who has done all the work Read earlier in Ephesians, while we were dead in our trespasses, destined for hell, men and women called children of wrath, literally sons of the enemy. Despite all of that, it was during this time of being sent to hell as we deserve. It is the, it, through that, in the midst of that, God loves us so much He sent His Son to this world for. We hear that so many times we think that God destroyed sin. Listen, God did not destroy sin. It's a basic misconception of the gospel. He never destroyed sin. He took all that sin and poured it on the Son. He became it. We, we just don't that all the time. There's no annihilation of sin. It's still in the world today. He took the wrath of God and made the Son become our sin. Literally put sin on the cross for us. And because of his resurrection, we're free from the penalty of sin. We have a relationship with him. We know him, we pray to him. He guides our steps. We protect that truth at all costs. No matter what. Let's close